everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, High Throughput Genotoxicity Assays for DNA Damage and Mode of Action Analyses. I am Michelle Ashton of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and brought to you by Miltony Biotech. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.miltonybiotech.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. Our speakers will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speakers. Dr. Jeffrey Bemis, the Director of Clinical Studies at Litron Laboratories in Rochester, New York, and Dr. Jakob Bunt, the product manager of flow cytometry instruments at Miltony Biotech. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Jeffrey and Jakob will now begin their presentation. Well, hello. Um, I welcome everybody to today's webinar about high throughput genotoxicity assays for DNA damage and mode of action analysis. We will discuss how you can modernize your genotoxicity testing and in which points you can improve your test performance in the most beneficial way. I'm Dr. Jakob Bonze, Product Manager at Milton Biotech, and I'm very proud to have Dr. Jeffrey Bemis speaking here today. He's the Director of the Clinical Studies at Lytron Laboratories in Rochester in the state of New York. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing some of your expert knowledge on genotoxicity testing with us today. With Dr. Bemis, we will discuss simple and efficient assays for the DNA damage and multiple endpoint studies, and how high throughput solutions improve your genotoxicity testing setups. In before, I will shortly introduce in the use of flow cytometry in genotoxicology and how our instruments, reagents, and software solutions will benefit your setup. With this said, I will hand over to the interesting part of Dr. Bemis. Replacement, reduction, and refinement. These are the well-known three R's of the concept first described by Russell and Birch, 1959, in their book, The Principles of Human Experimental Techniques. Around about 60 years later, this concept are now the basis of many national and international laws, which regulate the proper use of in vivo experiments and laboratory animals. Even if we are still far from completely replacing necessary in vivo experiments, the younger past could show that use of appropriate flow cytometric based in vivo assays is often capable of reducing animal experiments. Not only this, but rather more, they are also economically beneficial in terms of time, expenses, and convenience, especially compared to extensive microscopic-based analysis. To get a little bit more into detail, we'll have a look at the varying regulatory background of chemical testing. The requirements differ depending on the region as well as the type of chemical under regulation. For example, in the EU, for cosmetics, in vivo experiments are prohibited, but instead different in vitro tests are requ required. In case of chemicals, biocides, veterinary drugs or plant protection products, the regulatory requirements foresee to cover multiple endpoints by in vitro testing. Especially in case of biocides and industrial chemicals, 
a clearly negative result of this test impede further in vivo testing. The regulation for pharmaceuticals as well foresees in vitro testing in combination with in vivo testing. In the most of these cases, the choice of the right in vitro testing is crucial. Several OECD approved flow cytometric based tests can simplify your workflow and make the difference. Our MaxQuant analyzers bring the best qualification for high throughput genotoxicity assays. For a reliable and automated data acquisition, the MaxQuant Analyzer 10 is your trusted partner. With its up to eight colors and the ability of our express mode pack packages, this very small sized analyzer is more than capable of standardized and toxicological assays. The equipped violet, blue and red laser are spatially separated and build the center of a very robust optical system. From startup to shutdown, the, <clears throat> the MaxQuant Analyzer 10 brings a broad offer of automated applications such as hands-free calibration, sample labeling and compensation. Also very powerful is the volumetric cell count which does not require any beats. This and more makes the MaxQuant 10 analyzer a very reliable and simple partner. Another key piece for your successful assays are the right um, reagents. In the past years, the subject raised that one main reason for the issue was reproduci reproducibility in data acquisition is based on inconsistent antibodies. In 2018, it was discussed that even antibodies derived from hybridoma are more frequently equipped with additional functional variable regions. To dispose this problem, we developed our own reaffinity recombinant antibodies. These antibodies are defined on the genetic sequence, which also ensures lot-to-lot -lot consistency. The antigen binding regions are specified and validated for flow cytometry. And further, we use a universal IgG1 isotope backbone to simplify ex the, your experiment. Additionally, the FC re region is mutated to eliminate the background noise of the FC receptor. This makes our reaffinity recombinant antibody a reliable and consistent choice. A not unimportant area in which you really can improve your analytic wor workflow is software applications. I would like to show you two beneficial applications which will simplify your in vitro analysis with high reproducibility. The first one are our express modes. To ensure automated and standardized data acquisition, we developed an algorithm which is optimized to gate your panel and does the analysis fully automated. Express modes are sustainable even with in high sample to sample variation. They will simplify your flow cytometry assays via predefined experiments, data acquisition and analysis settings in a standardized way. The algorithm is developed and trained with a huge amount of data and adjusts the gating for each single data file individually. This ensures re reproducible results. In this we can say that standardized algorithm-based data analysis can reduce human error, creates reproducible results, provides standardized analysis based on mathematics and simplifies your SOP-based processes. Everybody knows that if you measure the same experiment with two different devices, even if they are from the same type, you will get different results. Maybe you also already tried to manually normalize the differences in the photon multiplier voltages and now the struggle in this. Therefore, the second application, our smart gains, 
uh, automatically calculates an intrinsic normalization and sets the gain for each device to 400. This ensures the exact same instrument setting from instrument to instrument and therefore an equivalent performance. This smart gains, like a lighthouse, consistently guides your instruments to reproducible and reliable data from test to test, independent of the user, on all instruments and all over the world. Standardization and robustness are the key points of our portfolio consisting of optimized reagents, instruments and software applications, which reach from research use only till the regulated environment. I hope you could find a beneficial solution also for your area. If you are interested or you have questions, please don't hold back and ask me after we listen to Dr. Bemis. Or you could write me an email to jakobb at miltonybiotech.de or you take a look at our website miltonybiotech.com. Now I know we are all waiting for, I will hand over to Dr. Jeffrey Bemis, who will further discuss the high throughput applications on genotox testing. He especially is an expert in DNA damage testing and multiplex genotoxicity screening. Again, a very warm welcome, Jeff, and thank you very much for having you here. Thanks, Jakob. Uh, I appreciate that introduction, and I also want to thank the audience for joining in with us today. So uh, I'm going to start right out in our discussion of high-throughput genotoxicity assays with a quick little introduction about Lytron, just to give you a perspective from where we're coming from. Uh, we've been in the genetic toxicology business for over 40 years and primarily focusing on the development of new and novel approaches, not only for preclinical product safety testing, which is where the bulk of our work is done, but in addition, we do some clinical research applications of these same endpoints as well. All of our assays are basically centered around flow cytometry, and that is going to be the theme of today's talk, high-throughput instruments combined with high-information content assays. So Jakob has given us a nice introduction to the instruments, and I'm going to focus for the rest of this presentation more on the assay side. The reason that we're doing this is we believe these higher-information content assays can improve compound screening have a nice complement to those regulatory required assays that Jakob was describing earlier. They can expand the range of information that you can get from the assays that you have to do. And then ultimately, again, as Jakob was describing, they do address multiple uh, aspects of 3R's initiatives. So before we get too far into the assays, I want to define a few different terms that you'll be hearing me use throughout this presentation, just so that we're all on the same page. They might not be terms that you're familiar with if you're not a genetic toxicologist. So I'm going to start out with a couple of these definitions. The first is a classogen. This is a classification of a type of genotoxic compound that results in DNA double strand breaks. And you can see a picture of a uh, nucleus over there that has been experiencing exposure to a classogen, in this case a classic uh, exposure of uh, ionizing radiation. And this is very well known for causing these DNA double strand breaks, a very uh, cytotoxic lesion uh, that we definitely need to be interested in if we're looking at genotoxicity. So classogen is one type or a mode of action of genotoxicity. The next one that I'm going to be talking about is anugens. These are alterations in the segregation or the way that the cells handle chromosomes primarily through uh, division when they're lining up at the uh, mitotic plate. As you can see here in this picture, we've got a nice division of chromosomes that are moving to either poles of the daughter cells, and that's the way it's supposed to be. All of these chromosomes are supposed to segregate equally. If you have alterations in that, if you have dis disruptions in the segregation, male segregation of those chromosomes, you can end up with anugenicity, which is obviously a uh, significant toxic effect going on in the cells. You can also get polyploidy, which is sort of an outcome where you have too many chromosomes in one and not enough chromosomes in another. I'll show you some examples of that later on. So we've got these two different classes of classogen, or excuse me, of genotoxic agents, classogens and anugens. And finally, the other category that we kind of lump everything else into would be non-genotoxicants. Now, many of these may be just as cytotoxic as those classogens or anugens, but they do that through other mechanisms. And in fact, they may ultimately damage DNA 
but they're primarily doing it through secondary pathways. Some examples of that would be apoptosis or damage to lysosomes, et cetera, but it's not a direct type of DNA damage such as we would see with either clastogens or antigens. I'm gonna go over a couple of the current in vitro approaches. This kind of uh, looks back at the slide that Jakob showed a little bit earlier and talking about the different batteries uh, for regulatory genotoxicity testing. These are some of the specific tests that make up those batteries. And, and in fact, I'm talking specifically about the in vitro approaches here. So we're looking in this case at the Ames bacterial mutation assay. Some of you may be familiar with this as a classic assay that gets used all the time and is still a requirement um, for submission of compounds for regulatory approval. The Comet assay is another well-known assay that is, again, looking at DNA strand breaks, similar to what we were talking about before, that would be caused by clastogens. There are a couple of other ones that do get used every once in a while. That's the chromosomal aberration assay, which is, again, a chromosome damaging uh, endpoint. There's some other assays, uh, HPRT, mouse lymphoma assay. These are a little bit more specialized and not quite as commonly used as the final one that I'm going to be talking about, which is the in vitro micronucleus assay. And again, this is our indicator of chromosome damage that we're looking at. And I'm going to spend a significant portion of the rest of the talk uh, addressing this with our in vitro micronucleus assay called in vitro microflow. So we're looking at micronucleus assessment in cell lines, and this is the assay that we have devised at Lytron Laboratories. The way that this system works is we're using TK6 human lymphoblastoid cells primarily, and we've exposed them to our test article, the compound that we want to find out whether it's genotoxic or not. So within that mix of cells, we have some healthy cells, we have some micronucleated cells if there was a genotoxic insult that they experienced, we have some necrotic cells, and in some cases we may have some apoptotic cells. So we have this whole mix of cells after we've done our exposure, and then we start processing them. The first step is exposure to a nucleic acid dye A. This is cytox green in this case, or excuse me, this is ethidium monoazide that we use here. And what we're doing here is it's a, a red dye. I'm using that as the indicator on the right-hand side of this picture. And you're seeing that it is getting in and binding to the DNA of cells with compromised membranes. So those that are necrotic, those are apoptotic. Those that have experienced a significant amount of damage, not necessarily um, directly associated with genotoxicity, but this allows us to first pass, identify those cells that are dead or dying. Then the next uh, dye that we use is uh, cytox green in this case, and we're adding that at the same time that we're adding a lysis reagent. So we're actually liberating the nuclei from those cells and looking at the nuclei, the micronuclei, and any other cell fragments that are in that cell population. This gets run through the flow cytometer, and I'm going to show you a couple of plots of that next. These aren't all the plots that we use for defining the different populations, but these are sort of the two more important ones. The one on the left-hand side has that cytox green nucleic acid dye on the y-axis, and on the bottom, uh, the x-axis, is that EMA red dye. What we're able to do is differentiate healthy cells from unhealthy cells. So the population that's kind of in that lower right, casting down in that region underneath the um, the, uh, the demarcation line there, those are considered dead or dying cells since they've taken up that EMA dye based on their compromised membrane. That allows us to get an indication of how much uh, toxicity is happening and actually gate those cells out and only look at the healthy nuclei. So when we go to this final plot here, where we've kind of switched around the axes a little bit, I've moved that cytox green dye to the x-axis in this case, and we're looking at forward scatter or an indication essentially of size of the particle on the uh, y-axis. That population, that blue population in the upper right-hand part are the healthy cells. So that's kind of, if you're familiar with flow cytometry, it might look a little bit like a um, cell cycle where you can see G1, G2M populations of cells there, and that's the healthy cell population. And then in the lower right-hand population, excuse me, lower left-hand section, we're looking at the micronuclei. So those are much smaller and less dense than the intact nuclei, and therefore they are lower in forward scatter and lower in cytox green fluorescence. That is where we actually enumerate the number of micronuclei that we are seeing in the cells. Now, that's not the only thing that we get from this. Because flow cytometry is a multi-parametric system, we can get multiple types of different information out of that, not just looking at micronucleus uh, um, formation. So in addition to getting those micronuclei and nuclei, they're a little bit more clearly defined here. You can see them labeled. We also get information on those main nuclei to look at things such as cell cycle, which can be significantly altered following exposure to a genotoxic agent. I'm showing you an example of that here, where you can see the gray profile is from a controlled cell type, 
And then the clearer dark outlined uh, uh, cell cycle profile is from a genotoxic agent causing a D2M block. So there's a significant change in the cell cycle that you can see there that's very characteristic of a genotoxic exposure. We're also adding in a bead, so we have a latex microparticle in there at a known concentration, and this allows us to look at the ratio between the number of nuclei and beads in each of the samples and give you an indication of cytotoxicity, so that when you compare the nuclei to bead ratio in the control samples versus the increasing concentrations of your test article, you can begin to see alterations in the number of nuclei, whereas the beads stay the same. And from that, you can determine the cytotoxicity based on uh, indices such as relative survival, relative increased cell count, which is a very important part of the guidelines if you're familiar with the, um, the assessment of genotoxicity for regulatory studies. You need to have a very good indication of cytotoxicity because those two things kind of go in hand. Genotoxic compounds are by nature cytotoxic, and therefore you need to control that very well in order to dial in um, the assessment of genotoxicity rather than just looking at frank cytotoxicity. So we get all of this information, and that's a lot for a single cell, but we've increased the ability and the efficiency of the assay to give you not only lots of information about a single well, but lots of wells across a single study. And we're using that uh, and taking advantage of the different types of uh, analytical platforms that are out there and processing platforms. And the one I'm going to focus on today is over on the right-hand side. That's that Milteni Max Quant 10 system that Jakob was just describing. The automated auto sampler on here that does um, robotic sampling of a 96 volt plate is what allows us to do that high throughput walk away kind of operation. So instead of historically where you used to have to sit in front of the flow cytometer and feed sample tubes in for every individual sample you needed to run, this machine does it for you and makes uh, walk away operations possible. This then allows you to significantly increase the types of studies that you're doing in terms of comprehensive dose response assessment. So in this case, we're looking at probably one of the most um, uh, exhaustive ex uh, ex executions of our assay in terms of looking at a single compound at 22 different concentrations per experiment. We're looking at a very close dose spacing, much finer than half dilutions. And based on the diagram that you're looking at here in the, the upper left-hand corner where we have the highest concentrations going down to the lower right-hand side where you have the lowest concentrations, we're covering over three orders of magnitude of a concentration range, and we're looking in quadruplicates at each one of those experimental conditions. So we're getting a significant amount of information out of a single study, out of a single plate, to give you a very comprehensive assessment of what is going on in terms of that test article exposure. What this then allows you to do is get very fine detail in terms of dose response modeling and to apply things such as benchmark dose, which if you're not familiar with it, is a type of uh, point of departure metric that you can use to look at potency of different compounds. So what you do is basically come up with all the different dose response data for each of your test articles, and then you can rank them according to the different endpoints that you've looked at. So in this case, I'm looking on the x-axis at in vitro micronucleus frequency, and we've got a benchmark dose uh, looking at a very specific change in the critical effect size or the effect or the response uh, of increasing uh, micronucleus. And on the, uh, excuse me, on the y-axis, we're looking in a comparison against gamma H2X staining, which is our DNA double strand break. You would expect both of these to be fairly consistent with each other because double strand breaks lead to micronucleus formation. And in fact, we're seeing a very nice correlation between those two endpoints in terms of the most potent compounds for either one of those endpoints being localized to the lower left-hand portion of the, of the plot and the least potent compounds being in the upper right-hand portion. So this is a very nice confirmation of the micronucleus endpoint that we're looking at in terms of ranking uh, compounds based on their potency. So in terms of the conclusions for in vitro micronucleus and our microflow system, we're achieving uh, chromosome damage assessment in vitro quite readily by flow cytometry. It's important to exclude the chromatin of those dead and dying cells because we don't want that to interfere with our assessment of true genotoxicity, as I showed you before. And we've determined that flow cytometry can provide uh, more than just those micronucleus counts. We're getting information on cytotoxicity based on relative survival, relative increased cell counts. We can look at those cell cycle perturbations that can be caused by genotoxic agents. We're getting information on membrane integrity. And finally, a little bit of information on mode of action as well. I'm going to go into that in more detail in the latter part of this uh, session. 
Finally, one of the things I wanted to, to discuss here really quickly is we've done a number of performance assessments. It's not just performance of the assay in Lytron laboratories. Since you guys are coming at this from uh, potential users, what I wanted to relay here is a large multi-lab validation trial that we did with uh, multiple different pharmaceutical companies and we sent them kits and they assessed them across a number of different test articles that we all looked at and then we compared our results and you can see excellent transferability, uh, uh, information on influence of apopto uh, apoptogens, as well as numerous other aspects of executing that assay across multiple different uh, laboratories. That's in our um, citation from Bryce et al. in 2013. If you're interested in any of these papers, you should be able to find them quite readily online. Otherwise, you can request them from me. So now I'm going to move on to the second part of our session where I'm talking about our sort of additional uh, assay where we're looking at a multiplex genotoxicity screening in cell lines. So it's something that we're kind of positioning a little bit ahead of micronucleus testing. And this is using our in vitro multiflow system. The reason that we created this is there was a bit of a problem with those traditional in vitro toxicity, uh, in vitro genotoxicity tests that I've been describing to date, especially with those manual systems that are out there. There's a significant issue with uh, throughput and scalability. So you really can't do high numbers of compounds if you needed to look at large libraries or do a lot of screening. It's difficult to approach those with those traditional systems. They also do have some issues with specificity in that there is a, an elevated false positive rate um, coming from those particular approaches, which obviously isn't something that you want to have to deal with if you can come up with better assays to, to replace them. And finally, mode of action information is kind of lacking in some of those systems in the fact that you can't get additional information beyond something is genotoxic or not. So our proposed solution was to identify a number of different biomarkers that we can use to discriminate not only genotoxic from non-genotoxic, but if it is a genotoxic compound, well, is it a clastogen, an antigen, or a non-genotoxicant? And we wanted to multiplex those biomarkers together into a simple add and read type assay. And what we devised is our multi-flow system. And this is our one-step add and read type assay. So what you do in the upper left-hand portion of this diagram is you have the cells that have been exposed to your test article. You take the portion of those cells, you mix them with our working reagents coming from our kits, and oh, excuse me, all at once, all of the outer membranes are lysed and stained simultaneously. There are no washing steps. There are no secondary labeling steps. All of this occurs in the same well once you've mixed the reagents with the cells and you've got exposure to the different fluorescent antibodies. Again, just in the nuclei, like we were doing before, we've lysed the cells and we're isolating our analysis just to the nuclei of those cells. Specifically, we are using a nucleic acid stain to look at just those nuclei and identify them for further assessment of our flow cytometric analysis. We've included a antibody against anti-H2AX, so this is our DNA double strand break marker, as I was describing before. We also have an antibody in there against phosphohistone H3, which is our marker of mitotic cells. And then finally, the one you may be most familiar with is an antibody against P53, which is a marker of genotoxic stress. Uh, specifically, in this case, we're kind of looking at a nuclear translocation mechanism because, again, P53 is found in the cytoplasm, but since we've lysed the cells and we're only looking at the nuclei, we're essentially isolating this to all those uh, P53 molecules that have migrated to the nucleus, and therefore that's where we're looking at our um, indicator of genotoxic stress. Uh, similar to our previous assay, uh, we're looking at uh, including a counting bead in there as well, so we can get indications of cytotoxicity from the nuclei to bead ratio, similar to what we were doing in our previous assay. During development of this assay, we looked at a training set of compounds. We're looking at over 84 different compounds that were taken from this ECVAM list that were well established and uh, characterized in terms of their antigenic, classogenic, or non-genotoxic um, potential. We we're doing this again in TK6 cells, treating them in 96 well place. We're looking at a solvent, uh, usually in DMSO, top concentration of one millimolar. We're doing up to 20 different closely spaced concentrations using a square root two dilution scheme in single wells this time. There are concurrent solvent and positive controls on the plate. We do a 24 hour continuous exposure, but we can actually go in and sample them at different time points. This is, since this is a suspension cell line, we're taking samples at four hours and 24 hours across the 96 hole plate, across the 20 different uh, closely spaced concentrations. This gives us an awful lot of information about the test articles that we're looking at. 
Some of the examples of that information, we're looking at a prototypical clastogen here. This is MNNG. And on the left-hand side, we're looking at our indicator of DNA double strand breaks. That's the gamma H2AX marker. You can see uh, at both 4 and 24 hours, we're seeing significant increases in that indicator of DNA double strand breaks because this is a clastogen and it is causing uh, DNA breakage. The next panel over, the pH3, phosphohistone H3, is actually showing a reduction, and this is due to a mitotic block, which is characteristic of cells that are undergoing this clastogenic type of activity, and therefore this is characteristic of a clastogen to see reductions in phosphohistone H3 labeling. We see increases at both 4 and 24 hours with P53, our indicator of genotoxic stress, and finally our final indicator, polyploidy. We don't see any change in that particular endpoint because this is a clastogen. When we switch over to an antigen, we're seeing a very different set of responses here. So with the gamma H2X, we essentially see no changes throughout either 4 or 24 hours of exposure, but in this case, the phosphohistone H3 marker is significantly elevated, both at 4 hours and 24 hours. Over at P53, we see an increase in 24 hours, but we do not see a significant increase at 4 hours with most antigens. So again, that's a little bit different from the clastogens. And then finally, at 24 hours, we see a nice increase, a very robust increase in polyploidy, a very well-known characteristic of antigen exposure. Now, when you think about all of those um, characteristics that I've just been describing across all of those different wells, across multiple, say, 96 well plates that you've run in a day, this really isn't the most efficient way to look at data and to start getting information back out of your test uh, articles and your uh, studies. So what we really needed to do was think about different ways of analyzing the data and to move from what some people have called eyeballometrics, which we were just kind of doing on that previous slide, just looking at the data, and switch to something that's more quantitative, objective, and a transparent method for returning information and making true genotoxicity calls. So we explored a number of different data-driven approaches based on that training set that we ran and ultimately came to combining of several different machine learning types of models to give you that sort of wisdom of the crowd approach across several different applications of machine learning. And then to follow that up and to test the models that we generated, we created some external test sets of new compounds that I will give you an example of uh, in the next couple of slides. What we're looking at here, before we go too much further, I kind of wanted to give you a little bit of a concept of machine learning because I think this term gets tossed around a lot and people hear about it multiple different times, but some people get kind of intimidated by this and they just kind of ignore it and just say, oh, well, I'll leave that to those computational science people and they'll just figure it out for me. But it, it's really a, a fairly simple sort of concept when you think of it just in terms of pattern recognition. So I put an object up here that and I'm sure we're all very familiar with. This is a stop sign, and I'm sure you recognized it as soon as you saw it come up on your screen. There's a number of different characteristics or patterns within this stop sign that we can extract from that object, and we can sort of look at them in pieces. So we've got the word stop, and then we've got the red color, and then we've also got the shape, that sort of octagonal shape. Those are all different characteristics or factors that go into making up that stop sign. And in fact, they're all the different things that our brain essentially puts together to recognize all those different patterns and ultimately have us make some sort of response to that. We see the stop sign, we are going to stop at that intersection. We can apply this to new situations because of the different patterns that we've understood based on our learning, and we can apply that to new situations and new um, experiences. So in this case, when I put up an unknown slide that looks very similar to this, so we can see the same color, the same shape, but we don't know the word that is there. In this case, it's also in the context of it's at an intersection, I'm, perhaps I'm in a car. I've used my previous learning, my machine learning in this case, that my brain is doing to recognize the different factors and then make a prediction as to what I'm supposed to do here, which would be stop at that intersection, even though I don't speak the language that is on that sign. This is really what pattern recognition is about in terms of machine learning, and that's essentially what I'm asking these different machine learning models to do with the data that we are obtaining from our method. So we were using three different models in this case to specifically go into the details. We've got logistic regression, we've got artificial neural network, and then we have a random forest model. We've combined them all together and we take a majority vote of the way that those call and we get information back on genotoxicity assessment. Now, I don't have the time to go into all the different examples here. I'm just gonna show you one specific example here where we're looking at the different compounds. That's our 84 chemical set along the x-axis. So those are all each of the individual chemicals and then they're broken up into those categories of antigen on the left, 
clastrogen in the middle, and the non-genotoxicant over on the right. And you can see on the, on the, excuse me, the y-axis, we're looking at probability of being called a clastogen. And it's pretty obvious from this, those compounds that are in red circles, that's the clastogen group, those have the highest probability of being a clastogen based on that model call. The antigens are much lower, and for the most part, all the genotoxicants are low as well. So we take basically you know, 80 to 90 percent predictivity or probability of being make these calls, and we call that a clastogen. So we've done that for all the different types of classes of compounds, the antigens and clastogens, and we get an assessment of the performance of those different models. And across all of those different models that we combine together, in terms of a priori clastogen, antigen versus non-genotoxic classification, we get a performance of 94%. So 94% accuracy in terms of predicting whether a compound was a clastogen, an antigen, or a non-genotoxic. Now, that's pretty cool when we're looking at a test set, at, a, at a training set, but we already know what that should be. So we need to apply sort of an external test set. So we took 54 additional chemicals that had not been part of the model. We haven't seen the data from this yet. We ran them through our system and we saw what the predictions would be. And in this case, the established um, mode of action of those compounds, we got 92% concordance with a priori classification of those compounds. Very good performance in terms of uh, predicting mode of action of genotoxicity. So in terms of conclusions, we have created this add and read multiplexed assay that provides a, an exceptionally valuable information in terms of genotoxicity potential. Not just telling you whether something is genotoxic or not, but giving you that extra layer of information to tell you whether it's a classogen, an antigen, or a non-genotoxicin. Those several machine learning approaches were very successfully used and highly performing in terms of their ability to take those multiplexed data and turn them into mode of action calls. Similar to what I did before with the microflow assay, we did an interlaboratory uh, performance assessment. There's another paper that's cited there, and you can see the excellent performance that we achieved when we ported this over to other different laboratories in terms of having them run it in their labs and looking at the same compounds that we did. Very good performance that was achieved when we did that interlaboratory trial. So ultimately, the, the outcome is this high content method can be used to synergize with the high throughput, easy to use instrumentation such as you would find in the Milteni um, portfolio. And that brings us to our takeaway here. This combination of high throughput assays with advanced machines can be exceptionally powerful. And the way that you get that is, it really comes down to more information can lead to better decision making. The kinds of decisions that you need to make in terms of your pipeline, whether compounds move forward, whether you keep something back on the shelf or you're actually moving it ahead in your pipeline, this is the kind of information that you need that's much more informative as opposed to the traditional way of getting this where it was just genotoxic or not. In terms of internal decision making and going back and having the chemist reformulate um, compounds or pharmaceuticals, it's much easier to work with those people if you have more information. If you, if you basically just come back and say, it's genotoxic, fix it, please, that's not the best situation for you to work with as opposed to, well, it seems to have some indications of clastogenicity. That gives them a bit more information to work with in terms of redesigning compounds. We're making continued improvements uh, that will hopefully deliver additional advantages to this combination of uh, our methods with those Milteni, Milteni machines, uh, such as the express modes that Jakob was describing earlier. And then finally, in terms of what's happening at Lytron, uh, additional new kit formats that we're exploring to look at even deeper levels of information going beyond mode of action of genotoxicity and actually looking at mechanism. So we can define some of the exact kind of DNA targets that are there as opposed to just looking for, well, this is compound is causing DNA double strand breaks. Well, how is it causing those double strand breaks? Is it interacting directly with DNA or is it interacting with some of the enzymes that are important for DNA management? Finally, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people that have contributed to this work. Uh, first, uh, all of my colleagues at Lytron Laboratories, Steve Bryce, Derek Bernanke, Svetlana Avlasevich, and uh, my colleague Steve Dertinger. These are the people that are working in the laboratory day in, day out, and have really contributed to uh, the improvements and the advancement of the methods that I've been describing today. Finally, I'd like to thank the people that I've worked with for years at Milteni Biotech, Jakob, Nick, and Matt Drew. Uh, we've established a really nice relationship with this group, and uh, we continue to have uh, uh, a great time with that company. Finally, I want to cite the, uh, the funding that provided significant amount of money um, for the development of these methods. So these are both SBIR grants that were given us, to us through NIEHS. So we definitely need to thank them for their contributions in uh, developing these assays. And with that, uh, I will say thank you, and we'll be able to take some questions. Thank you, Jeffrey and Jacob, for your informative presentations. 
We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Our speakers will answer as many questions as time permits. Okay, our first question is, you mentioned using TK6 cells, but do your methods work with other cell types as well? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, yeah, so the vast majority of our work uh, using both microflow and multiflow was done in TK6, as I described. Uh, but both of those methods have been tested with a number of other cell lines. Uh, if you look back in our publications uh, under the microflow system, you will note that we have uh, had some publications where they used attachment cell lines such as CHO-K1 and V79. And then uh, multiflow has also been applied to some of those attachment cell lines, as well as some some very recent work that we did with HEPG2 cells as well. So um, if you're interested in applying other types of cell lines, you will find instructions and protocols for that specifically in our instruction manuals that are in the kits. Or if you want some more directed guidance from us, you can contact us and uh, we will help you uh, make decisions and, and understand what you can and can't do with our with our methods. Thank you. Okay, next question. What industries would typically use the multi-flow kit? Um, the bulk of our work has been done with pharmaceutical companies. So they're using them primarily for drug safety screening. Uh, they have regulatory requirements that are um, set up specifically for uh, micronucleus testing, both in vitro and in vivo. So there's a number of gene tox tests that need to be done in order to submit compounds to, say, the FDA for regulatory approval. And we're finding that companies um, will use this in their early screens in order to set themselves up better for the in vitro micronucleus testing that they're doing so that they can refine those tests and understand kind of what they have going into them. Uh, if you understand you have an antigen, you might be doing more concentrations at a closer dose spacing. Uh, if you have classogens, you might have a different kind of um, toxicity range that you would be interested in, in looking at. So pharma is really big into this, but also we're getting more and more interest from other industries such as uh, chemical industry, agrochemical, uh, industrial chemical, and then um, certain regulatory agencies are also just doing research on it as well. So we have some colleagues in the FDA the research division that are using it for, say, tobacco research as well. So a number of different industries are, are utilizing this particular assay. For the multi-flow assay, have you looked at other test sets beyond the one you mentioned? Yeah, so I described in there um, the, the training set that we used, and then we did an additional test set that was sort of outside of that training set. And uh, that gave us an awful lot of information to sort of uh, set the assay up. But we did some additional work with some uh, other groups. One of those specifically was with uh, Merck. And so that was a very pharmaceutical-centric kind of test set. And that was published, I believe, back in 2018. You can find these if you search for our, our publications. Uh, and we did very nice performance with that, I believe, up around the high 80s, 88% accuracy when we were looking at um, a priori classifications. And then another one I'd mention would be some work that we did with our colleagues at the National Toxicology Program. And this one was a little different from a lot of the work that we'd done previously. Much of that was done in sort of uh, pharmaceutically relevant compounds. Uh, with the work that we did with NTP, they sent us a plate with quite a few sort of environmentally relevant compounds. And in that case, uh, we did the same kind of uh, procedure, running it through multiflow. And in, I believe we were getting a high 90s or mid 90% uh, accuracy when we were looking at the, um, the classifications that were returned on that set of compounds as well. So whenever we put uh, external test sets against this, uh, we still tend to hold up really well and get nice performance of the multi-flow assay. Great, thank you. Are the models you generated for the multiplex assays transferable to other labs, or would we have to run our own test sets? Um, back when we were when we were developing that assay and we we were doing our interlaboratory trials, we we looked at that quite uh, extensively. And while we weren't really all that satisfied with the just taking say one data set from one company and moving it to another one, or moving say the Litron-centric data set to another laboratory. Um, and this is based on, you know, 
just the different um, instruments that they had, the way that the cells would kind of behave in the different laboratories. We found we weren't particularly satisfied with sort of just transferring data. But what we came up with for that was we've generated another test set, which includes about 24 compounds that an individual lab would run. And they can get through that pretty quickly in that, in that 96 volt plate based format. And they generate their own set of compounds that they would use as their internal training set. And then they would create, or we would help them create the algorithms around those and the prediction uh, uh, machine learning sort of uh, systems that they would then apply to their new compounds that they would be running. And in fact, this is what we've done when we've set up other uh, contract research organizations that are running this assay. So we have gone and basically sort of installed the assay at their site using that 24 compound set. And now they're moving ahead with sort of client fee for service work and they're basing it on that 24 compound set that we initially installed for them. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have one more question here, and that is, could you give us more detail on the mechanism of action kit you described at the end of your talk? Right, so um, I spent a lot of time talking about what we sort of consider the base assay or, or like standard multi-flow. And that essentially gives you the information that I, that I spent that time on, which was uh, genotoxicity, yes, no, and then additional levels of mode of action. So whether it's classogenic, antigenic, or non-genotoxic. We focused in on some of those specific modes of action and most heavily in on the antigenic mode of action. And we have um, devised what we're calling our antigen molecular mechanism uh, assay. It's still based off of multiflow, so it's the same platform but we have subbed in and out a few different antibodies and some components that are in that kit. And what it's really suited for is once you've made that first classification with the base uh, multi-flow assay, then you would move forward the antigens that you discovered or, or revealed in your um, assessment, and you would dive a little deeper and look at them in a bit more of a mechanism of action kind of process. So instead of mode, we're looking at mechanism. And we've been able to find that it can help you distinguish between two major classes of antigens that we've looked at, and those are being tubulin disruptors, so binders or stabilizers, and then the other class would be protein kinase inhibitors, primarily working through an aurora kinase inhibition uh, mechanism. So we have a system that will now allow you to further differentiate not only if it's an antigen, but also whether it is uh, disrupting tubules, like a tubulin poison, or if it's a protein kinase inhibitor. So that is a kit that we are currently testing right now in sort of another interlaboratory validation trial to see that it can be transferred to other laboratories. And we hope to have that out on the market pretty soon, but um, just keep in contact with us and uh, uh, we'll definitely won't be keeping that secret. So you'll know about it when it will become commercially available. Um, in terms of other assays that we're working on, um, there's another sort of application that we're, we're piloting now that we're trying to uh, get out into the market eventually, and that was going to be looking at sort of a clastogenic mode of action, but determining whether they are direct DNA reactive uh, clastogens or whether they're indirect. So depending upon whether they're binding to DNA or whether they are, say, interrupting enzymes and other DNA manufacturing and handling um, proteins, you can have different types of clastogenic activity. So in that case, we've got other means of looking at that and determining not only, again, clastogenicity as a mode of action, but also the mechanism by which it is interacting with DNA. And then finally, we're looking at some other um, kits that will be um, hopefully in the future looking at things like uh, reactive oxygen species, mitochondrial potential, that kind of thing, that are fairly relevant modes of cytotoxicity that can kind of come into play when you start talking about non-genotoxic mechanisms of action that we would like to differentiate from those more predominant clastogenic, anugenic modes of genotoxicity. So we're, we're continuing to sort of develop and evolve within this multi-flow platform and um, hopefully we'll continue to have more and more kits out in the future. Great, thank you. I would like to once again thank both of our speakers for their informative presentations. Do either of you have any final comments for our audience? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Um, I want uh, also to thank you again very much, uh, Jeff, for sharing um, your expert knowledge on genotoxicity testing with us. 
and uh, I want to advise everybody um, to, if you want to have further information, to go to our website multinbiotech.com and download our application node on high throughput genotoxicity testing, um, which um, consists the max quantan and the uh, in vitro microflow kits from Lightron. Uh, thanks also the audience for listening. Yeah, I'll follow up on that really quickly. I want to thank uh, Jakob and, and Milteni for inviting us here today so I could uh, give you the presentation. I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the work and the collaboration that we've had throughout the years. Um, you can see it's, it's a good team coming together with Milteni and Lytron. Uh, we've been able to really sort of leverage the technology side and the methodology side between our two companies, and it's, uh, it's really win-win for us. Uh, I want to thank Michelle for coordinating this. She did a really excellent job coaching us through this and, and um, bringing this to you guys. So uh, my last closing uh, thank you will go out to the audience and for tuning in today and listening along. And again, if you have any questions, yeah, get through the channels that Jakob has described or contact us directly at Lytron, and we will give you the support that you need. Thanks again. We would also like to thank Labyrinth and our sponsor, Milton Biotech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Labyrinth will alert you via email when it's available for replay. And we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.